Okay. Great pleasure, pleasure to be a part of uh, PSG again. Uh, in the fourth, I was a part in the first conference. Uh, good to see everybody here. Uh, the topic here that we are going to talk about is uh, very like you know not touched upon so frequently, and we miss out as clinicians and as practice medical practitioners. We hear a lot about carbohydrate management, but we miss out on the micronutrients. As we know very importantly that all the pre-dom uh, defects, uh, the uh, talking about all the birth defects that has to be as the GDM itself is a complication. GDM itself is a complication. The macronutrient management is equally important to prevent side effects during gestational diabetes and pregnant. We look upon all the major for uh, controlling the Pregnancy-induced hypertension. I know it is important for the muscular development and the bone development. Zinc, again, important, um, which is not looked upon. The RDA values, though it is increased only by 1.5 milligram during pregnancy, but also is required equally on a daily basis. Folate, the most important element, which is almost twofold increased, during the time of pregnancy, very important in controlling the birth defects. Uh, if the folate levels are low, it might lead to preterm babies, also megaloblastic anemia in pregnant women, and later on also cause anemia in the child. Similarly, iron, though the levels are not, uh, requirement is not increased much, but as you know, the Indian scenario is very important as every woman, almost 50% of uh, women are come with iron deficiency. So the start itself is very important for us that we are uh, taking care and checking up all the micronutrient status, especially the ferritin levels, the B12 levels uh, when the patient comes in. Magnesium also on a regular basis is important. Uh, a low magnesium level is uh, classified with preterm birth defects, preeclampsia also. Vitamin C having antioxidant properties uh, also uh, can lead to like you know the high because during gestational diabetes there is large amount of oxidative stress. So it's important that we are uh, giving up all the types of micronutrients that de-stress the um, oxidation and it is also important for the intrauterine growth. Vitamin A again is not taken in a higher uh, amount. In fact, you might have all heard of about also not giving raw papaya to pregnant women. Many of us hear about that as because of the excess amount of vitamin A. So vitamin A should be given in the optimal amount naturally. We do not give any kind of excessive uh, vitamin supplements. Here in the table, we have also mentioned the form in which the multivitamin or the particular supplement, the particular micronutrient should be supplemented. The second table suggests the major, these are the, I would say the mini micro ones, the, which are again, the B complex vitamins. We usually give a a beaker soup or a, a multivitamin where we see that you know the all the micronutrients are taken care of. But as medical staff and nutritionists, we should also take care that not only these B complex vitamins are just given as supplements, but also naturally. So individually. Uh, Dr. Kancha will be talk, taking up each of them. A very good evening to one and all, and uh, it's a great pleasure again for being invited at PSG. I'm Dr. Akanksha Patsya, I'm an endocrinologist from Surat. So, we have tried today to incorporate the importance of uh, micronutrients uh, in pregnant females, and typically, we'll be bringing you forward with uh, a very interesting case which we, uh, as endos and uh, gynecologists, say, see din day in and out. but there were some minor you know mistakes which could you know land that patient into major complications but to give a highlight of uh, really uh, how important these uh, vitamins and minerals are we'll be trying to give you a highlight of you know everyone in detail 
first one would be the calcium so it is uh, it has a major role as an anti hypertensive agent not being classified as an anti hypertensive agent but it has a beautiful effect of preventing uh, pih for that matter and also if there is preeclampsia uh, it ha- it again with magnesium and calcium both of them play a very vital role in prevention and also in uh, you know helping the treatment part for the same so the most important thing why the requirement of calcium increases is because around 300 mg per day of calcium is absorbed by the child uh, from the 30th week of pregnancy in a major form and the most important challenge uh, with respect to malnourishment for calcium would be landing our patients into pih and that has uh, dreaded complications as we all know and just you know supplying optimal dose of uh, calcium uh, is going to help us in preventing the risk of preeclampsia and it has been documented uh, in multiple studies that it could help us in reducing the risk of preterm births by 24% and risk of pih by 55% uh, in uh, pregnant females again it has a great role in immunomodulation also as we re- as we know and it has uh, been also documented that it has a, a very vital role in pancreatic insulin secretion which is a great uh, which is of grave importance typically in females right now from the first trimester itself uh, with respect to one more you know uh, implication of the same through the rcts that we wanted to highlight was that uh, one of the uh, rcts showed that 70 pregnant women were given vitamin d and calcium uh, doses to their optimal requirement and that proved beneficial not only in improving the glycemic status preventing glycemic fluctuations uh, improving lipid oxidation and preventing the oxidative stress in gdm females next please yeah second uh, the the uh, to give you a highlight again of the most important uh, you know factor of uh, using vitamin d is uh, the doctor of skeletal health we can say it as that and it has been uh, you know documented as around 60% of pregnant female are d3 deficient uh, and vitamin d has been you know as has been having a lot of pleiotropic benefits just not skeletal health and it is uh, actually having a lot of anti inflammatory properties that we could uh, really document even during the time of covid where it helped us savage a lot of uh, you know patients who were uh, you know who could be prevented from going into complications so not only that it also helps in you know having optimal insulin sensitivity in patients with good vitamin d levels and also has yes regulating cell proliferation differentiation and uh, better glucose metabolism lesser the vitamin d the patient is hi- at higher risk of developing uh, gdm and vitamin d uh, through its multiple implications it also helps in preventing visceral adiposity and which is a very key factor in uh, preventing gdm next please another very important uh, mineral for that matter to discuss would be about the b9 vitamin uh, folate and folate has been uh, you know a very important factor again for known as a savior of uh, you know for the for preventing birth complications and typically we know it is a very important vitamin for managing the cell uh, division and dna synthesis so it has been uh, very well documented that 5 mg per day of folate is a must to be started actually 3 months prior to planning pregnancy and it could reduce the risk of birth defects by 78% and insufficient folates obviously uh, not only has a poor implication on females uh, with respect to increasing gdm incidence but also uh, on the health of children and the deficiency uh could implicate into you know developing uh, neural tube defects down syndromes preterm deliveries and uh, elevated homocysteine levels so it has to be uh, sought for at timely initiation of this is very important next please uh, there are multiple uh, sources of folate that we could uh, you know tell our female patients to be taking uh, during pregnancy and even before planning pregnancy all luciferous vegetables you can clearly see and uh, typically the broccoli the chickpeas and the lentils spinach have been found to be you know and you know quite enriched with folate and uh, they are a great go and uh, even uh, tomatoes and strawberries walnuts are also a great go for our patients the most important thing is whenever we are supplying folate we cannot miss b12 
and when we are supplying b12 we cannot folate they are the sibling supplements as they both of them manage the car, one carbon metabolism which is very much important as they act as the methyl donors in their diet and everything begins with dna methylation and dna methylation is actually going to reciprocate into gene expression so if the beginning of uh, the dna methylation is at defect uh, with response to uh, with responding to reduced amount of uh, actual requirement of b12 and folate which is not supplied well it could implicate into genetic mutations and imbalance in the b12 and folate levels actually are the very you know are, are at a very prime importance now for creating the visceral adiposity because of disturbance of car one carbon metabolism uh, and it has been also seen uh, in multiple studies that lower the maternal folate levels it indirectly corresponded to increase adiposity in children and low b12 level in mother predicted high insulin resistance in babies uh, which was which is again it's a very preventable thing for us and we should be more and more forward for you know giving this uh, very important supplementation vitamin supplementation to our patients and it has been now we are we are documenting more and more uh, children who have a lot of visceral adiposity they also have uh, uh, very less b12 levels and folate levels next please Hithi, you can take forward. Uh, sure. sure. Uh, yes. So talking about the two most, as we know, like uh, Dr. Kanchan just said, vitamin B12 as well as uh, talking about iron, they go simultaneously. As far as anemia is concerned, we know that uh, we have all types of anemia, and majority, fifty percent of the pregnant women are found to be anemic in India. So talking about gestational diabetes, also we have to look upon that uh, iron levels are taken care of, as the is as iron is very very important in child development. It's also important for all the kinds of enzymatic pro processes which involve the brain development of the child as well. So from the very start, we have to make sure that iron, B12, and as well as folate are given together, uh, depending upon the levels. So iron and calcium. Few tips that we should take care of as we know that iron and calcium have a complete opposite uh, absorption mechanism. So they should be and should not contradict each other. So iron and calcium should be taken at least a gap of three hours. Usually, uh, clinicians uh, try to place the iron supplements like early in the morning, which are taken empty in the stomach. Empty stomach and calcium is usually given after means post lunch at least by. More than three hours of gap, we usually recommend like at least six hours. So either post lunch or post dinner. Vitamin C always helps in increasing iron absorption. That is why we try to practice that we ask our patients to squeeze lemon in all your major meals because iron sources mainly come from whole grains. The richest source of iron is dates, but considering all our whole grains and pulses are also good sources. So whenever we are, our patients are taking your main lunches and dinners, try to advise them to squeeze a white, a full lemon in it for better iron absorption. Also, early in the morning, if your patients are taking a little bit of nuts and seeds, they are also good sources of iron. So vitamin C, lemon water, along with on an empty stomach, will increase the iron absorption even more. Again, studies showed that uh, extremely low levels of iron of GDM women was found. Compared to normal pregnant women in a 2012 study. Similarly, I found a study from uh, found a study from an Indian data, in fact, from Coimbatore on zinc and magnesium as well, uh, showing again comparison between the control group that was the pregnant women versus GDM patients, and we could see the mean levels. Of uh, both serum, zinc, and magnesium was lower in cases of GDM as compared to normal pregnant women. So, uh, can you see the difference almost by like you know uh, one one gram or more? So, zinc again is uh, important as an enzymatic uh, zinc and magnesium both as an enzymatic action, and also they have an action formation of action of insulin. The Christopher 
uh, graphic studies when we see at the micro level of uh, zinc we can uh, of insulin we can see that zinc crystals are also found so it has a very close relation both zinc with insulin and also zinc has a role in the maternal and fetal tissue accumulation magnesium similarly is important in carbohydrate metabolism and is also an activator of many enzymes in insulin dependent uh, for the absorption of glucose so the again the study showed low uh, magnesium serum magnesium levels in gdi patient compared to the control group few uh, iron rich sources and cover zinc rich sources are mainly from your nuts and seeds legumes again egg yolk is the richest source i would say for all b complexes for all zinc magnesium all minerals egg yolk is the richest source Similarly, for magnesium, poultry rich sources, even avocados, such nuts and seeds are good rich sources of magnesium. Where a uh, few of the minerals, if we talk about, which we don't look up on, on are mercury. Where we have to be extremely cautious in case of uh, patients for all pregnant women, because uh, high mercury sources can cause uh, dangerous, like, you know, cause deaths also. So fishes such as sharks, swordfish, tilefish, and mackerel, which are high in mercury, should be taken should be completely avoided. And uh, even if patients are taking fishes, somebody who is a non-vegetarian, you would limit it to only one point five gram per fortnight. That is once in fifteen days. Chromium is a very essential uh, again, and many studies are coming up, but not enough data. To prove it right, but chromium picolate is the picolinate. Am I right, Doctor Kanja? Doctor, uh, chromium yeah. picolinate, right? Yeah, yeah. It's the most absorbable form of chromium, and many studies are coming up where chromium has also shown significant results in insulin signaling. But there is not enough data. In fact, beryllium salts also present in like small amounts in dill seeds, black pepper. It's usually a metal which is uh, found very Low amount in the food sources, but uh, so enough data is not there. But studies have shown that it helps to reduce the glucose levels in diabetic patients. Uh, Omega three fatty acids, as we know, as I said and started, that the entire gestational phase uh, and gestational diabetes causes is a case of very high oxidative stress. So all antioxidant agents, especially omega three, EPA and DHA, will be very good and important, and also for the neuro development of the child, also important vasodilation, reducing the inflammation, and uh, last but not the least, even few supplementing of probiotics and bioinositol, especially in the case of kids with having a comorbidity of uh, PCOS. It is good that uh, we at the early stage we are giving iron hospital. Okay, so we'll uh, quickly run through the case. Uh, I'll be just giving you uh, the synopsis of the case that we had prepared. Uh, we had a case of uh, a twenty-seven-year-old primary gravida who presented to us uh, in the second trimester during her twentieth week of gestation, and she was diagnosed with GDM with the uh, fasting sugars of eighty and postprandial sugars of two one zero. and uh, she had typical symptoms of fatigue breathlessness constipation vulvar vaginitis and tingling sensation in feet and uh, on physical sim symptoms uh, it showed she had peri orbital edema and non pitting pedal edema and dryness of skin and grade 1 goiter next please this patient actually in her first uh, trimester itself was uh, diagnosed with hypothyroidism and uh, there were some implications with respect to the proper guidance which she was not given and that we'll try to highlight sorry all right so talking about her physical characteristics typically a uh, stubby looking woman with a bmi of 30 and uh, she had a comorbidity of pcod with her parents both being diabetics and mother being a case of autoimmune hypothyroid next please when you check her lab parameters mm -hmm. yeah when you check her lab parameters uh, in the first trimester when she was looked upon by the physician her uh, hemoglobin was just 10.5 uh, her fasting sugars were normal and her postprandial sugars were normal her hba1c was also normal uh, tsh was high for which she was prescribed 75 micrograms of uh, thyroxine 
Her anti TP wo- antibodies were positive, more than thirteen hundred. She was deficient in B twelve, in calcium, and vitamin D. In second mm-hmm. trimester, when she presented to us, she told us that she was given uh, thyroxine seventy five micrograms, uh, optimal calcium and iron supplementation. But still, uh, her iron was low. Her uh, sugars were, uh, you know, were first time coming into the GDM range with twenty weeks of gestation. And HB one C also cropped up to. Five point nine percent TSH was still not under control, even in spite of giving seventy five micrograms of aldroxin, and B twelve was still uh, in the in the sub levels of three fifty. Uh, calcium was okay, and vitamin D was also in the still in the insufficient range. Next, please. Then we tried to understand the patients. Uh, you know how this patient was taking the supplementation and the thyroxin. So uh, what happened was this patient was. Taking thyroxine in the morning when she got up, but she was taking uh, almonds and uh, jeera water along with uh, eltroxin. This was the first mistake that she was taking, uh, that she was doing. Secondly, she was taking uh, calcium and iron together. She was not keeping the gap as uh, Hethi was uh, trying to highlight that there has to be a gap of minimum three hours between iron and calcium. And also, this female did not keep even uh, you know the gap of uh, two hours, which is required between. Uh, eltroxin and any supplementation like iron or calcium these were the two major mistakes this patient was making and for her insulin uh, for her sugar controls she was prescribed bolus insulin for her postprandial sugar spikes and this patient was made to understand when she presented to us that what was the dietary intervention that had to be made the macronutrient portions has have been beautifully you know discussed but with respect to micronutrients the timing which was very much important between iron and calcium was explained to her the timing which had to be kept between thyroxine and the supplementation was educated to her and natural substances which could increase her uh, iron levels and calcium levels uh, because we typically understand that uh, patients with autoimmune hypothyroidism also have anti parietal antibodies which could land these patients into hypo uh, you know uh, less vitamin b12 levels and poor absorption of iron and for for that matter uh, such patients require proper counseling and the mistakes were rectified for that patient and we got better results for that uh, hethi would just like to conclude with the the dietary interventions that you made with that patient please yes a quick tip here yeah so um, like uh, dr kanchu also mentioned or uh, dietary patterns of eating were already disturbed and moreover the major meals also were very high carbohydrate rich like you can see that you know she was mainly eating carbs so there was lack of fruits and vegetables in the diet mainly no salads uh, in her major meals and in fact her calcium intake natural calcium intake was also very poor She was majorly taking khakra, bhakti, and rice throughout the day, uh, and her overall protein intake was only thirty five gram per day. Macronutrient status also we can see that every all fruits, vegetables, calcium, all of them are lacking. So for the dietary interventions, we were increasing her fiber, and the uh, patient was also highly constipated. So to improve that, we increased water intake as well as fiber intake. Uh, since the patient used to crave a lot of sugar, and uh, also see that the sugar levels were high postprandial of the meals, we try to incorporate natural sugar for her in the form of milkshakes and uh, khajur in the diet in the form of natural sugar, which is also high in iron. In fact, if you are uh, incorporating spinach in the form of blanch form and not crushing it also in the daily diet and giving it, or maybe doing a green juice therapy also helps overall the hemoglobin status status because the hemoglobin was also very low. So we try to incorporate all these measures for improving her micronutrient status and adding lemon to colder meals, like I had explained. Uh, so overall. Concluding, when we when we were talking about improving the micronutrient status for uh, gestational diabetes and uh, overall pregnant women, we should make sure that apart from taking uh, the normal nutritional meals, they are also taking natural mineral rich foods that is mainly and nutrient dense uh, dense also that is mainly coming off your natural mineral coming from fruits. In fact, you can also include coconut water, naval pani. Very very important. Uh, once in a year, maybe just one piece of coconut 
the patient can start during the day, start her day with it. Uh, practicing exercise also is equally important as it will also help in you know regulating and improving the metabolic status and the metabolism of the patient. Uh, it's very important that we are practicing good hygiene methods also, like washing of the vegetables and fruits in a right way so that the absorption is again good and whatever the patient is ingesting is in a pure and a good form. And uh, regular follow-up is definitely a must. The entire team, not only the physician, the nutritionist, all of them, in fact, the diabetes educator, also in case of high glucose levels. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hethi. Dr. Raja, uh, over to yeah. you. We don't have any question, but for the constraint of time, uh, we would like to keep it just to one. Okay. Um, excellent presentation by both the speakers. In fact, I have one question to Dr. Akansha. Uh, Dr. Akansha, well, it was a very crisp presentation. I would like to hear from you whether do we follow any pre-gestational assessment of this micronutrients? We talk about supplementation once the patient gets pregnant or or, or probably uh, many times we fail to do that as well in the rural setup. Do we have any set guidelines or do we tend to practice a pre-gestational or a pre-pregnancy micronutrient assessment? Uh, thank you, Dr. Raja, for that question. And I think we very well understand that now most of the uh, females are quite aware about you know planning pregnancy and pre-conceptional counseling. So when, when they are now coming to their gynecologist, most of the time they are obviously screened for uh, pre-gestational diabetes nowadays. So uh, for that matter, because PCOD is quite common. So the that is a very important factor. And when these females are being tested for uh, you know sugar levels, they are very much also you know tested for their hemoglobin levels, the iron concentration and the folate and the B12 levels and calcium levels. But there are, as of what I know, uh, the the CBC is something which is uh, mandatory and which is being done uh, for all the patients, but not the other vitamins like B12 and folate are not being done. But we, as we see in our Indian population, most of our females, even from uh, very highly refined, uh, uh, you know, societies, they are still having uh, iron deficiency, still having B12, vitamin D deficiencies. So they are not being, uh, you know, implicated to have these before planning pregnancy. But nowadays, the gynecologists are called quite proactive and they even before planning pregnancy, they try to implicate these things. Uh, I think three months before the pregnancy, the, di the gynecs through which whom which we work with, they, you know, work in coordination with us and PCOD females are very, quite very well, you know, maintained with their levels because they're already having good follow-ups with us. Uh, but uh, uh, not all females, depending on the place where the, where every female is. 